Welcome to Healing Voices Project, where we share stories of addiction, grief, recovery, and courage. And also from people who work every day in the field of substance abuse who discuss their experiences and advice. I'm Mike Torville, your host. Thank you all for joining us. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us again at Healing Voices Project. We're really glad you're back with us. You know, each week we have different guests and, and a variety of guests. It's not just about addicts telling their stories. It's not just about a person who's an alcoholic sharing their story of recovery. We have family members. We have parents. We have public officials. We have counselors. We have all kinds of different people, and the reason for that is to share perspectives, to learn from each other and say, what's it like being a parent of an addict? Was it like being an addict and going through recovery? And how about public officials who set some programs up and legislate um, programs and laws? We've had State Senator John Velas on. We've had our Mayor Sapelli on. And so we really try to share different perspectives so we can learn from each other. Because often those opinions, those perspectives change, obviously, from being a parent to being a, a child, an addict, or a family member. And today, we have a guest, uh, Carrie O'Connor. And um, Carrie sort of fits all of the above, okay? Carrie is a woman in recovery, a proud parent of a 16-year-old son. Carrie's a Gulf War veteran, a local school district mental health training coordinator, a third-term Aguam school committee member, appointed member of the Aguam Veterans Council, coalition member of the Partners for Youth, and substance abuse prevention. And I'm not done yet. <laughs> and board member of the Alano Club in Aguam, a recovery club that houses this 12-step program, a Lions Club member, and last but not least, a rock and roll band member. <laughs> so, Carrie, you hit so many boxes that we check, 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 check. Yes. Um, but what I'm wondering, with all the spare time we have left over, you must have hobbies to fill in all that spare time. And, you know, come on. What do you do with it? <laughs> How do you squeeze all that in? Well, first and foremost, thank you for having me sure. on this show. And I think that um, it's really important for those who have the experience, strength, and hope to be able to uh, share experiences to yeah. the community. And um, the most important thing that I do um, to, to, keep me, to keep me grounded is to share my experience, strength, and hope. Mm -hmm. I speak all over uh, Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, and just because I am a woman in recovery, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, I'm just a normal human being. Well, maybe not so normal, um, but that this disease of addiction does not discriminate against anyone. So right. first and foremost, my recovery, my sobriety comes first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're, you're a mom, too, so that keeps you going. My mom, yes, I have a 16-year-old son, and he is just, he's my heart, he's, he's everything to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very grateful to be able to um, be there emotionally for him today. Yeah. Well, that's great. And, you know, also I'm, I'd like to share how we got to know each other and how you, why you're here, how you're here. Um, and appreciate you. You've been a, a listener of, of the podcast. You've been watching all along, and I didn't know you before that. But um, you had some constructive commentary about a few things that we were talking about, and um, Les um, said, "Hey, you know what? I was speaking with Carrie, and you know she'd she'd like to participate. She'd like to be on the show." And I said, "All right, let's meet." So you and I had lunch to talk about this, and our lunch. Um, uh, we could have sat there all afternoon, I know, talking. <laughs> we got into all kinds of topics, and it was great. Um, and sometimes after I meet with people, um, and we have such great conversations, I say, gosh, I wish I, wish I could have just recorded this conversation. It would have been a great podcast. It would have saved us the trouble of coming here. But uh, so, but I think we, we really covered a lot, and I know we, we have a lot to cover in a, in a short time. But um, I guess I'm bringing that up to say thank you for reaching out and I guess I'll use that as an invitation to others. If you're watching, if you're listening, and if you have anything that you want to add, or perhaps be a guest yourself, or just say, hey, I have a few ideas and suggestions, 
we're open. We would love to hear back from you. And there's easy ways to reach us by email and by phone and go on the website, Healing Voices Project, and you can contact us very easily. So I appreciate you reaching out. I appreciate your suggestions and really glad you're here. Thank so, you, Mike. Yeah. Uh, so you're involved with all these programs now. A handful of them, which yes. you know, and 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 that's wonderful to to really um, invest in the community and your family. But you, this is something that you started participating in um, after you were in recovery, and so. Uh, but what brought you there? You have your own personal story that that got you to where you are now. So you want to share how this all evolved? Sure, um, Mike. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so I. Um, I'm involved in a lot of lot of um, boards in the community, um, and the work that I do today is because of my own personal experiences and to be able to, again, bring the message to the community. I um, grew up in a household with, um, I'm an adult child of an alcoholic, and what that means is that I grew up in a household with an al alcoholic father. Um, and it was, it was challenging. It was challenging as a child. Um, and, and again, you know, our parents, you know, my parents, I have a wonderful rapport with them today. I love them very much. And not any parents go, go to college to become parents. And so, yes, there was physical abuse. There was emotional abuse and neglect throughout my childhood. Let me interrupt. Any brothers and sisters? Or? I do have a brother. He's yeah. two years older than I am. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. And so at that point, um, I felt as a child, I didn't feel, I didn't have that nurture um, being brought up because there was a lot of, a lot of um, domestic violence going on in the house. And at that point, um, I, I was in the other room a lot, um, listening to all this um, that's been, that was going on with my family. And I, and I felt alone. So as a child, I felt alone. And what made me feel better was to um, be able to just a help others. And the kids that I was uh, friends with uh, were not, they were into alcohol, they were into, you know, back in, you know, when I went to school, I graduated in 1995, there was substances that, uh, per se, LSD and mushrooms, and, um, and so I started to be, I started drinking at a young age. Uh, first time I tried a drink, I was 14 years old, and um, from that point forward, I liked it. I liked how it made me feel. Uh, my self-esteem, I felt like I was on top of the world, because I didn't have those feelings when I was a child. I didn't, I was unable to, uh, to feel, and so my alcoholism had started at a young age. Um, at that point, I did get into some, um, I was not an easy child, an easy adolescent. In high school, um, I just graduated with the skin of my teeth. I um, did get into a lot of trouble going to school, but that didn't start until my progression of my oppositional behavior and my behavioral concerns and issues was really starting uh, junior high to high school. Hmm. And... Um, and so it, it got me to a point where my senior year of high school, I was, um, I ended up uh, signing up for the United States Navy because at the age of 14, I had three jobs. I did everything I could in my power to not be in, at home. And I developed independent skills at a young age because I, I had to, I, I had to for survival. So at that point I joined the United States Navy. Can I ask you? Sure. <clears throat> How long after you graduated did you leave for the Navy? I graduated in June of 1995, and I went to boot camp in September of 1995. Okay. So you had your summer, and I then did. off you went. Okay. Yeah. I had my summer. Yes, <laughs> I did. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So you went in in, 90, in September of 95? September of 1995, correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. I was 18 years old, and I had no idea... Um, what I was in for, um, I went to boot camp in Great Lakes, Chicago, and I um, was handed a set of orders uh, to go on to the U.S. of Simon Lake in Sardinia, Italy. Now, I wish I paid more attention in high school mm -hmm. in history class and, or geography class because I had no idea where that was. And that was when the Internet was really just starting to, to 
yeah. explode. Yeah. Um, so I ended up um, going over Sardinia, Italy, and my ship was stationed at uh, in La Maddalena, Italy. Okay. And that's where I spent the three years of my, um, from 18 to 21 overseas on a ship. Most of it in Sardinia? Most of it in Sardinia. That was our home port. It's beautiful um, there, isn't it? Oh, it's absolutely it's, it's like Hawaii. Almost. Gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah. What I didn't know as I was at, at, at the age of 18 was that um, the culture of women going into the service, especially on a ship, I didn't know that I would be a target um, for uh, sexual assault. So there was very... There was not a lot of women on the ship. There was I, I predominantly worked alongside men, and um, I became an assault survivor. I'm an assault survivor, military sexual trauma assault survivor today. Um, and I did my time. I did my three years. I didn't want to say anything to anyone that it was happening to me because if you told, then um, I may have had the opportunity to be dishonorably discharged. And I didn't want to disappoint my family or my country. So I continued to... You just endured it. I endured it. Mm. And it became numb. Um, I became numb, became uh, adjusted to the environment, into the culture. And my drinking, my alcoholism really ramped up during those three years of being overseas in the service. A lot. I drank a lot. Any opportunity that I had, I was drinking to the point where I blacked out. Heavy... What were you drinking? Like just I was drinking bourbon. Bourbon. Yeah, mm -hmm. bourbon. Um, I liked whiskey and bourbon, so it was liquor, predominantly liquor. That does get the job done faster. Oh, it, it did. And you know, I did it for. It wasn't for me. It wasn't. It wasn't fun. It w just wasn't fun. I I drank to self medicate, and I didn't know any better. I couldn't tell anyone what was going on. I didn't have the support system where I was in the service. Um, but there were a lot of positive things that did come out of my tour overseas as well. When I got out of the service, um, I had an opportunity to re-enlist, and they, you know, gave me another set of, they said that I could stay overseas on another ship that was replacing the ship that I was on, and I was like, absolutely not. I wanted to get an honorable discharge, move on with my life, because I just didn't want to endure the, the ongoing um, harassment and the assaults that were occurring to me. So I got out of the service um, with no transition plan, no support from the military. It was pretty much you're on your own. Just dump back here and uh, go. Good luck. That's right. So I moved <laughs> back with my parents at that time. I was 21 years old. I did have an enlistment of eight years. So I did a few years reserves after that. And then I went inactive reserves. So I had an eight-year contract. And at that point, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So um, a, a family friend, a family member of mine asked me was I, if I was interested in becoming a correctional officer. <laughs> so I said, sure, why not? Um, so I ended up being hired for a summer hire as a correctional officer. I went through a two-week academy. And at that point, um, I, on, while on the job, I was exposed to um, cocaine. And so that started my alcoholism, cocaine addiction for many years, hmm. many, many years. You were working throughout that. Correct. I was yeah. working. I was a functioning addict. I didn't realize I had a problem. Um, I went to college. I worked full time and I bartended. And bartending was my social life mm -hmm. because I could get anything I wanted. And at that point, I was so far into a few years into my addiction and alcoholism. Um, it was just I was functioning until I couldn't function anymore. This went on for a few years. It did. And at some point, you, you got married during that. I did. So yeah. I, I got married um, three years. Uh, my son was, I got married in 2011. And in 2011, my son, um, to uh, my ex-husband, um, and, and was also in a um, highly abusive domestic violence marriage. And... At that point, my son was five years old. Uh, four, he was four or five years old at the time, and I didn't want to 
uproot my son. I kept it quiet other than my family. My family knew about it. Um, but I was sober at that time. So You had given up drinking. I, I did. I went to rehab. My yeah. first rehab was... Um, in in March of 2008. Okay. And so I went to Carlson Detox because my cocaine use, I couldn't stop. Uh, I, that's all I could think about. And it, and it got to a point where um, it's just, it was, I was so heavy into it. I, I just, I lost, I hit rock bottom. And for me, rock bottom was not about losing anything, losing materialistic things. Rock bottom was I lost my soul, completely lost my soul. So that started my journey of a decade of sobriety of 10 years of sobriety in 2008. 2008 to 2018. Um, so during your period of sobriety, that's mm -hmm. when you had, you know, then when you got married. Yes. And had a child and all these things. Okay, life's back. You can do start a family, right. everything else. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of us who um, have been in addiction and are in, in recru recovery and active sobriety, you get everything back, right? And so, yeah, I'm I engaged in a 12-step program, going to meetings every day. This was after rehab. Um, develop it, developed a social network with, with sober, sober men and women and of all ages and all backgrounds. Met a lot of great people in the rooms of a 12-step fellowship. Bought a house. It was working. It was working. Yeah. It was working. Yeah. It was working. Until it didn't. And <laughs> until it didn't anymore. Yeah. And and the most important thing yeah. as um and and I'm only speaking on behalf of myself is that the reason why I say sobriety, I sobriety comes first is because if I forget where I come from, then I'm just I'm just a drink away of relapsing. And I don't have another relapse in me. I just don't. And, and I tell, and this is the, the realness of this, I tell people all the time, you might as well dig my grave. Um, I was in a domestic violence marriage, and... Um, did, did, and again, I don't mean to interrupt you, but... Sure. Your husband, did, did he drink? He did not drink. He did not he drink? He was a dry drunk. He did not have a program. Okay, so that wasn't a factor in the... No, it okay. wasn't. We just, it wasn't right. a factor. All right. Um, so throughout the years, um, and as being a survivor, and and also I, I have a master's degree in psychology, bachelor's degree in criminal justice, I'm thinking that I can save people, right? So I'm in a in a marriage, and maybe things will get better because being in a domestic violence marriage or in a relationship is really tough to get out. It's very easy for my family to say, "Why don't you just leave them?" Well, I have a son to think about. I have a house, everything's in my name. And so, I, once again, I pushed it aside. My family members were, my parents, thank God, that, of the support that I have of them, my son and I would have to go to my parents a lot to escape. Um, in March of 2018, I relapsed. And I relapsed hard. What brought that on? I couldn't. Well, first and foremost, I didn't put my sobriety first. I was in and out of the court system. I became a victim again. And what I mean by becoming a victim again is holding on to anger, holding on to resentments. When I filed for divorce, I had an active restraining order on my ex-husband. Um, and I was in and out of court a lot. Um, and because I was um, the one who had the income and um, pretty much I took care of him my, throughout the marriage and my son. Um, he did work periodically, he worked part-time. Um, but I, I, allowed, I allowed the court system and I allowed my ex-husband to completely eat me up alive to where I forgot where I came from. And so I started drinking again. And I picked up bourbon. Mm -hmm. um, two months into, into my drinking, um, I picked up substances, cocaine again. I became the three, I was on a relapse for about eight months during that time. And they say the progression, after having a, a lengthy period of sobriety, they say the progression is absolutely worse. Yeah. And, I, and I have to tell you, it was to the point where I had written a will, contemplating prearranging my funeral, couldn't get out of my basement. And um, lost some weight, too, you said. I lost about 80 pounds. You lost 80 pounds? In a short period of time. And trying to still hold everything together 
and telling people, oh, this is a divorce diet, um, you know, just those excuses. And, and I've had many, many years of knowledge in the program. Um, I was in complete active addiction to the point where I did not care about my family. I didn't care about my son. All I cared about is how am I going to get my next fix? How am I going to get my next fix? That's Nothing it. Nothing else mattered. Right, Nothing right, else yeah, mattered. Right and, you know, I was working at the time. Um, it, it, you know, this disease of addiction, I, and I'm very grateful that I relapsed. Um, I celebrated a little over, on November 14th, I celebrated three years back in sobriety. Um, I have a little over three years of sobriety, um, active sobriety. And prior to that, I want to say about 13 years of um, from sobriety first. altogether. Yeah. And Can I just ask you to explain? You said you're, you're almost glad you relapsed. Mm -hmm. Now, some people would say, why, why yeah. in the world would you? So there's got to be a reason. Sure. Something that you said, this changes what? Um, For me, the way, looking, looking back at it, um, I was, I was, it was a blessing to be able to move forward and to be able to share my experience at a whole nother level um, and to continue to be involved in the recovery community. And what I mean by blessing, and I understand what you're saying, that Typical uh, people who are watching this is like, oh, that is that's a sh that's shameful, right? That's that's hurtful. That's wow, what a what a you know the stigma, mm. the stigma around addiction and recovery is, it is so imperative that um, people continue to share their experience, strength, and hope, and and let everyone else know that you can still be successful in sobriety. Well, as we. Relapsing is very common, obviously. It's part of it. It's, it's part, of, part the disease. of it. But the fact that you've gone through it and came out of it gives you a, a empathy, understanding, and a, an ability to talk about it, a, an ability to relate to people who have gone through it. Before. Absolutely. So I think, and is that which part of yes. what you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't. So one of the biggest things that I, my ego is, I don't. So my ego has. Um, I'm not afraid to share my story anymore. Like I was hiding behind closed doors, even in the midst of active recovery prior to my relapse. We talked about that at lunch mm -hmm. a little bit and how in an unexpected way, it's very liberating, right? Yes. You can finally say, I can be myself and be honest and not that's have right. to have the stress of, bur of that burden of carrying it and that's hiding right. it. And, and that's awful. And I'm in a yeah. wonderful place today where I have um, you know, 12 steps of recovery in my life and therapy. I have a village that's, that I, I have to continue to um, engage in treatment. And not alone is that treatment with just substance abuse and my recovery, but it's also with the trauma that I've endured throughout my life. And to let people know that, you know, I'm not ashamed anymore. Mm -hmm. I, that is just my, that is how I feel today. And that creates a level of humility. And that level of humility is, you know, for those who are watching, I I'm not worried about what people are going to say about me today, because if there's ten people out there watching, and and my story can can help one person, that's all that matters. Because sharing my story ultimately is helping me more than more than you even know. Yes, it and I've seen that so many people have said, you know, once I was able to tell my story, it just it just felt good and indescribably good to be able to to not hold that in. But also too is if you if your story can help somebody, yeah. in so many ways it will. But and we often say you never know how many it will. We could have somebody listening who says, "Gee, that if, if she could do it." And maybe there's some aspects to their life that relate to yours. They're a mom. They're right. a veteran. Right. They have an abusive relationship, and and so on. You've overcome all of those things. Yes. And I think that's really um, the the. Once you have, and we talk about courage a lot, the courage to say, all right, and I know we had our mm -hmm. state senator, John Vilas, on, mm -hmm. and I just remember him saying, you know, and he, I remember him, the way he said it was, he just shook, shook his head and he said, that was one of the most hardest, most courageous things I've ever had to do. And you could tell he meant it because all that he'd gone through, and he's a veteran, yep. and so many others have said, it took forever for me to do it, but once I did it, wow, what a life-changing event. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So here you are now, having shared your story, and now you're involved with, I mean, we can talk about, you know, the mental health training coordinator sure. and all the things you do. But, 
And yeah. so what, what was your first step up to say, hey, you know what, I'd like to help others and, and, and get involved with programs? How sure. did you do that? So when I got out of the service, um, you know, I, I ended up, I wanted to continue to help people and, and I wasn't addressing my own traumas. And it, and it always felt good um, to, to help others. And so uh, working in corrections and going to school, um, getting my bachelor's in criminal justice and master's in psychology is, is because I've worked in the field of mental health for many years as well as substance abuse. And I'm, I have, um, I'm able to identify with a lot of families, a lot of, a lot of those that are in the community that I supported and helped and treated because of my own personal struggles, right? So I'm not just straight out of college and saying, yeah, it, it's just, it's at a whole nother level and, and I still have passion in what I do today. Um, I worked for a mental health agency for nine years, um, for many years on care coordination for uh, families and children who struggled with social emotional disturbances and be able to coordinate their care as well as um, real, at an intensive level. And um, also the Veterans Council, a lot of the things that I'm involved in today, even, even going for um, being, being an elected official on the, the school committee, is I bring a different perspective. I have a son who um, has an autism. He is diagnosed with autism. He's 16 years old, and he's thriving today. He's thriving today. And I, I'm a parent who also has had to utilize services for my son. And again, that's you know the stigma around that. I, um, I'm very thankful and grateful for all the supports that are out there. And so <clears throat> I ran for school committee because, because of my own experiences and also to, um, it felt good for me to continue to help the community at a different level because of where I was. I was, a, I was an adolescent, I was a teenager who struggled, who really struggled through school. I, di I did not like school, I despised school. I went because I went and, and cause I had to, number one. Um, but I ran because, because of my personal experiences as well as being able to send a message to the community that I am only human. I am real. I'm doing this. It's not for political gain whatsoever. Um, this is because I really want to make an impact on those families and students who struggle um, it, because it, it's real, right? This is real. I joined the Veterans Council because it, it you know, I, I really have a passion in, in working with veterans um, just based on my experience because for years I wanted nothing to do with the VA. I didn't, I did not, I am a service-connected veteran, but it took me many years until the first time I was in sobriety to receive treatment, trauma treatment around what happened to me. I think me. one of the reasons you, you might look back and reflect and say, you know what, there's probably a lot of people who went through what I went through and who felt, uh, I'll say neglected, but, but just maybe went through abuse or went through the disconnect or, you know, like you said earlier, when I was done, I had no path, no plan, just here you are, good luck. And so I'm sure there's people who can, I'm lost, what do I do? Right. So you can provide some guidance there. That's right, yeah. I definitely yeah. can. I've, yeah. um, so I, I've joined the Veterans Council, I, I ran for office, um, this is my third term, and I, like I said, I'm not, I, I'm not quiet I, I, I'm at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I'm not ashamed of who I am today. Just because I'm a woman in recovery and struggle with alcoholism and addiction, doesn't necessarily mean that's all of me. Uh, to me, it's, it's just the opposite sometimes, the respect. And I think just the courage that you display and the, the respect that I have to say, wow, you've stepped up and you've overcome so much that it's, um, it's just the opposite, actually, I think. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate <laughs> A lot of high regard for what, you, what you're doing. Um, and, and now you're involved with the Alano Club. Yes. So, talk about that? Right. So the yeah. Alano Club Inc. of Springfield is um, a 501c nonprofit organization. We are, it is a sober club in town in Aguam. Um, I am on the board um, and we house 12 step fellowship. We house 12 step programs there. And we have a recovery club in town and, and it's really important that the community is aware of that. Um, and, and again, you know, we have multiple meetings that go on in that club weekly. We have over 500 people in and out of that club on a weekly basis for all walks of life, all walks of life. They are anonymous programs. We house these programs. We are not a 12-step program, but we are a 501c organization. 
And the goal moving forward is to continue to provide that support for those who are struggling recovery. And, and most importantly, is to develop some social and recreational activities in the future because mm -hmm. that is an area that is crucial. So when someone first comes out of um, sobriety and they're new, it, they're, they have a difficult time to how, how to socialize without that drug or without that drink. And so being surrounded for those who have had few years in sobriety that can live their life without it and seeing that it provides a level of mentorship for whether it's our adolescents, young adults, it, it, like I said, it, it, anyone that who struggles. How do people find out about it, the Alano Club? Where do you find information about it? Sure. Yeah. Um, we are, the, uh, the Alano Club is located, you can find information on meetings, 12-step meetings that are housed there and at um, westernmassaa.org. And that's also another resource uh, for, they, it, we have, in Aguam alone, um, we have over 100 meetings going on at any given time throughout the week. This is, this is throughout the week. At any given day. At any given day. And Correct. Meetings. You could walk. You never know. You could be walking at the next corner where you live, where you reside. There may be a meeting going on at that particular church. If somebody wanted to find out, they go to Western. Western. It's yep. Okay. It's WesternMassAA.org. And also, too, if they want to find out the Alano Club, it's spelled because it could be A L A N O Club. Is that correct? It is. Yes, yes. the yeah, Alano so. Club. It's 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 we we it's the Alano Club. And again, we have other board members that um, can also speak on behalf of it. But we are located at 36 King Street in Agawam, mm -hmm. and you can find a list of meetings, again, on westernmassaa.org. Okay, that's good to know. Yep. Um, <sighs> you, you, <laughs> you're involved with so many things. Yes, and I it's, am. I don't know how you keep track of it all, but um, if it was me, I'd be like, oh, no, was I supposed to be where? <laughs> I don't know how you do that. Um, and, you know, I entertain if there are, and, and also I always entertain anyone yeah. who wants to call me. Um, and, and if they know a family member who they is call struggling, you personally? they call me personally. I mean, I do a lot of 12 step calls, not, not alone, but with other friends of mine, where if there is someone who's struggling and that, you know, that needs to go to detox, I mean, there are times where I have driven 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night to bring someone to detox. Um, out in Greenfield. So we, I uh, help anyone in need at any time. Obviously, if I'm in a meeting or whatnot, but I'm always available. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what time of the day is because I'll tell you what, it didn't matter what time of the day was when I was drinking and when I was using drugs. So if I, you know, and that's the way I look at it today. I have to maintain my sobriety first. I go to meetings every day, still, every day. And that is the most important. And, you know, I'm only one drink away from relapsing. Right. One drink away. When someone asks me, am I going to drink again? I can't give you a definite answer. I live in today. Yesterday's gone. Tomorrow's a new day. And so continuing to help others and to spread the message is what I do. And that, and that it's not, it's because it helps me. And, and I truly have empathy for those who are struggling. And so I always entertain phone calls, um, always available for su supporting others. If struggle. somebody wanted to get in touch with you, what's the preferable way to do that? I can give you my phone number live. It's 413-575-3582. No shame today. And, and Carrie has a phone bank right now. Everybody is on hold, on waiting at the phone bank, ready, ready to take That's your okay. order. That's okay. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's it's always the resources is always yeah. a uh, big topic in, right now in today's society, especially. Right, and I, I got to say that's that's wonderful that you volunteered to to help. And you know, often it, it's a stranger, it's somebody who you didn't know. It's mostly mm -hmm. when. Um, there are a lot of people who I don't know that I receive calls from, mm -hmm. and that's okay. It doesn't matter because there's only one thing we have that's in wonderful. common yeah. is the desire to stop, yeah. either desire to stop drinking or using drugs. That's, that's I can identify. Earlier you said that you were an entertainer, and uh, <laughs> that <laughs> you were, uh, <laughs> you're in a band. I am. Yeah, talk about the band a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. my band is called The Gratitudes, quote, 164. Um, 
We are a band. We are a sober band, and we um, are currently getting ready for an, for a fundraiser um, right now to be a feature band for an open mic event happening locally in town. And so I've always been into music. Mm. I took piano lessons when I was young. You still um, find a way, even as a kid, to squeeze stuff in like that. It's, can... <laughs> you know, if it, the way that I look at it today is that yeah. is my passion, it's my hobby, and it, and it makes me happy to be yeah. able to play. It's a great outlet, yeah. It's a great outlet, yeah. and instead of, you know, getting together and playing for a community who, you know, especially an important community, a sober community, is for me, it's that's that's an undeserved, that's grace, that's an undeserved gift, yeah, and it's. A form of meditation for me. So it's not just, you know, hey, we're playing for you and and want any feedback. It's we do it because we have passion in what what we do and we're giving back to the community. That's why. And the name of the band again. Just the, the gratitudes. <laughs> and and where where you'll be playing it at, uh, well regularly or is no, it so we, we play um this this will be our third event. So we, we really started forming during through th- during the pandemic. Yeah. And so when the pandemic hit the next day on March, I believe the pandemic it was March sixteenth, um two thousand where are we? So it's two thousand and twenty. Almost two years now. Yeah, it's been two years. So on March sixteenth I called up a friend of mine and I said, Hey, you know what? All I could think about was people who would be relapsing because all these meetings, all these 12-step fellowships would, would shut down. So at that point, I called him up and I said, well, let's start a meeting outside in Southwick. So we did. Well, that meeting went from Southwick to right in our, our, ba- our local backyard to School Street Park. And so throughout the pandemic, we had, there was, and, and, and we had, at one point, we would have 40, 50 people in the field sitting in a circle and, 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 and um, you know, sharing our experience, strength, and hope in, in a 12-step fellowship, and it became a wonderful thing. I also held a lot of, um, again, of course, masked because we were all outside during the summer. We got together and started playing, and there's a lot of, lot of talent, a lot of talent out there. And I was like, oh, this is wonderful. So we ended up putting on uh, playing live music, just getting together and jamming. And for those, and and I would open up uh, my house for those who would want to listen and experience some fun throughout the pandemic, so which would help them deter them to relapse. And so that's how we started uh, to give back to the community that way. Oh, that's great. Yes. That's great. And it's going strong. We are. We are. We have a lot of fun. Um, And it's not, we incorporate other people who just want to play with us. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, if, you know, if there's anyone who hasn't played in a long time, we just, it doesn't matter. Just come and play with us. But we do have some set players that we rehearse, um, that we rehearse, but we entertain anybody to come play with us. That's great. So. Well, I, I can't wait to step into the next time that you're playing because I want to know. Um, well, um, I, I know time is starting to run short. Um, is there anything else that we didn't get to talk about that you, that you want to say? Sure. <laughs> I, again, I, I, you know, as I mentioned this before, I, I really want to make it clear to the community that we do have support. We do have help. Um, Agawam alone, I am the District 2 Chair of, of, um, of the area of a 12-step fellowship alone. Like I said, we have over 100 meetings that go on throughout the week. Um, we have a sober club here right in town. There are conferences going on, active conferences. There's a lot of recovery. And also, you know, the, our students and adolescents, um, we do have um, current things going on at, at, through the Agawam Public School District. I did reach out to Superintendent Sheila Hoffman, and she did give us a little bit of information of what we are doing um, within our schools. So we are currently collaborating with Elms College Nursing Program, um, and it's to develop a presentation around psychoeducation on substance abuse for students in health classes. 
We are currently re-collaborating B- a BHN contract for substance abuse screening and consultation service. One of the good things about that is we, as an Agwam school district, as far as mental health supports and substance abuse supports, we do have a contract with Behavioral Health Network that is within our school. So if our adolescents, our teenagers are struggling, and, you know, I have to say that it kids are experimenting with substances, I mean, as early as the age of 12, you know, so this is real. This is happening. And we are um, in the process of promoting more awareness. Partnered with Center for Human Development, it's the Goodwin House that houses, um, it's a 90-day treatment program for young men, youth, the age of 13 to 17. Um, and so, and we have a fam- the Family Resource Center for the communities in collaboration with the Culture of Care Network meeting hosted by Agwin Public Schools. And also we are hoping to work with the district attorney's office youth task force as we did last year to help families navigate internet safety. So social media is also another big area. Um, So, you know, there will be in the near future um, what the school district is working on is consultation with Behavioral Health Network for substance abuse clinicians. And so that is just some, some support that we do have for our youth because alcohol and drug addiction predominantly starts at an early age. It does, and I know you and I talked when we, yes. when we had lunch about the schools and maybe getting some feedback from the students' focus groups and things like that, and I think that could be, I, I think if you'd like to, we'd love to have you back because there's so much in any one of these topics that we could talk about and spend some time on, right. and I think it's valuable for people to know about, obviously. So I, I think we'll, we'll have to get with you and, and other people involved with this and talk more in detail about these. Yes, as these I mean, I just develop, yeah. pinpointed some some yep. areas of our school district of what how we're addressing yep. substance abuse. We also have a safety officer as well yep. um, that just spoke publicly um, and gave a, a safety update um, with the Aguam community. So absolutely, it's it's necessary. It's imperative. Again, as I say, the stigma on this. Yeah, and starting early, as you said, it just, it's early. worth saying again. In, in the schools, I think it, the earlier you can nip it, it's so easily said, but it's just it's hard to, hard to get through that, you know. That's right. Um, well, thank you very much for, thank for you. coming and, and sharing all of this. And um, I'm really glad that, that we had to, to spend this time. There's so much that we didn't get to talk about, I know. and I know that. <laughs> it's okay. But, uh, <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll do that. And, and thanks. Um, for all the research and information you provided because now the, the thing that, that goes through my head because there's so much information to absorb, if somebody just recognizes they have a problem, they just say, you know what, I've had enough. I've reached the rock bottom. I've lost my soul. Mm-hmm. Something just, I'm, I'm defeated. It's the first thing they do. It's the first call they make. What, what do they, where do they find is the very first point of contact to say, I need help. So before it's too late, um, and if there's a, a youth or even a, an adult um, that recognizes that they have a problem, BHN, Behavioral Health Network, um, has support. There's crisis services, and crisis is available 24-7. And, and how would they just pick up the phone they and pick say, up the phone. And call. They call 413-733-6661. Um, there are a multitude of detoxes and um, programs. Okay. In the area, we do have quite a few. You would suggest that is maybe the first time. And, and by well, the way, well, there's many different ways. I mean, first, yeah. you know, it, once you realize and recognize that you have a problem, mm-hmm. uh, talk to a close friend of yours, or if it's if it's a youth, ask to speak to a counselor or someone, an, a, a trusted adult, a trusted adult, or um, a trusted friend. And and hopefully it gets steered because also if you yep. call BHN and mm-hmm. through the number you just read is. They would say, okay, you know what? And they would certainly go through the, the see where you are mm-hmm. and then where where, the, where where to point you. Right. So yeah. um, BHN Crisis Service will, yeah. will offer you resources. Mm-hmm. And also there's what's called a Western Mass Substance Abuse Directory. And so that you can find that online. And there's also, there are a lot of programs um, in the Western Mass area, whether it's if you feel that you need a counselor, a substance abuse addiction counselor, or if you feel that you need to go to a detox, um, you can find that information as well there if you don't feel comfortable calling crisis. But I, I would highly suggest and recommend your um, calling BHN crisis because not alone are they there just for an actual crisis, whether it's your homicidal, suicidal, 
or um, you know having substance abuse issues is they're also there for support. They're there for support. So I would recommend, and if you don't feel comfortable talking with a close friend that you you may feel or you think that you do have a problem, call Crisis because they will support you. They have trained clinicians on the other line. Um, they have family partners to be able to talk to you and also give you some resources around that. Okay, that's great, great information. Well, thanks again. Thank you. <laughs> um, and again, we'll have you back and um, appreciate everybody for listening. Um, that was a, a great session and um, so much information to absorb. So thanks again. Thank you. We will see everybody in the next episode. Thanks. Bye-bye.